before I get to that part of it, I want to say I just came from a session led by Stacy Curtis and uh, Shane Ryan that was absolutely remarkable. And it reminded me just how important our mission as teachers at UF is. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research, but I want to talk about teaching today. And I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to follow Andy McCullough because he said some crucial things today. And I want to touch on those. And so I'm talking about digital literacy. Let's talk about what that term means because a lot of what we've heard today is about online learning. That's not inherently digital literacy. So culturally, as humans, we've moved through three eras. One, starting with orality. All of our communication was based on our voices and our gestures. Then we moved into literacy, reading and writing. We're in a new time, digital literacy. This means more than knowing how to operate software. This is an epistemological shift. We think differently, we work differently. 2016 changed everything for us because it was the first time in our global history that more information was communicated visually. 80% of our communication now is done visually in the public sectors. <coughs> And it was also the first time that we accessed the internet with mobile devices more than desktops. Our world is now mobile in a very different way. So part of what I want to talk about today isn't just what we're doing in the classroom, but how we have to change how we're thinking about those technologies and thinking about how we're using them. So let's start off with a very easy point about digital literacy and some of the things we've been hearing about at this, at, at, at this uh, conference. And I want to talk about one of the big snags we run into at UF and faculty across the country. And it's not the students, it's us as faculty. It's our resistance to the new technologies, our willingness not to engage. So I'm going to talk a little bit of today about how you can start to integrate digital projects into your curriculum without having to become a digital expert or without having to change your curriculum. Because let's face it, how many of us look at all this stuff and think, oh crap, I gotta go teach a software package? When am I gonna teach my content? I'm gonna show you how to do that without worrying about you teaching software. Because our literacy is very different. So a minute ago, Andy made some really important statements. We're number nine, we're number nine. As I've said all over the country, on behalf of the University of Florida, I would like to thank the governors of Wisconsin and Illinois for making that possible by ruining those systems so that we can elevate. So we got to celebrate number nine for what, three months before they announced we're gonna become five, top five? I'm glad that Andy brought up UNC. Roy Cooper, governor of, uh, of, of North Carolina, he's pitching the same balls Wisconsin was. Good chance that UNC will fall out of the top five, giving us some room. He's just got to keep doing what he's doing. But Andy made another point when he brought up UNC, the fact that they were here looking at what we're doing, and he used the word vanguard. You want to know why UNC is vanguard? Because last year, about 18 months ago, UNC made a move that's happening all over the country that UF is not making. This move has now been made at Clemson, University of Arizona, Utah, University of Southern California, and this is a buy-in to the concept of a creative digital literacy, digital creative campus. We won't make that buy-in here. Yeah, I'm talking about a particular software package. I'm talking about Adobe's Creative Cloud. I'm talking about the fact that when your students go on the job market, it doesn't ask them for proficiency in GIMP. It doesn't ask them for proficiency in open source software. It asks them if they know how to use Photoshop. It asks them if they know how to use uh, Premiere, InDesign, and all of the other Adobe Creative Cloud. UNC requires all of their students to learn those applications. And they provide them to their students for free. So part of what I'm getting at with this is if we want to talk about ourselves as vanguard in terms of tech, then we also have to provide those tools for our students so our students can make things. But in order for our students to make things, we also as faculty have to integrate that literacy. So, as I said, most of us are afraid to take on new digital projects as assignments in our class because we don't want to have to teach software. I'm gonna give you a little hint. How many of you looked at Adobe Spark? 
know it. Adobe Spark is free. It is a multimodal project. It allows you to make everything from memes to multimodal video, uh, integrated image, uh, data visualization, you name it, and it is the absolute most intuitive thing you could possibly use. It doesn't require any special, special software knowledge. Here's my challenge to you faculty when you're getting your syllabi ready over the summer for fall, stop giving your students boring syllabi that are written in boring eight and a half by 11 page measurement. Make a multimodal spark page for them. Let them see that you're invested in the digital turn. Let them see that you think about what digital literacy means. I guarantee you that in 30 seconds you'll understand how to use Spark. Spark.adobe.com free. By the way, I'm not being paid by Adobe. <laughs> Though I kind of like the idea, Patrick. <laughs> um, I'll write it down. The other thing is Adobe provides this wonderful free textbook on how to use all of their stuff. You don't have to teach software. There's a concept that's going around the country that I think a lot of us would like to adopt. It ties to problem solving, it ties to critical thinking, and it's called learning how to learn. It's teaching our students to have malleable methodologies that they can apply in various contexts. We don't need to teach softwares. We don't need to teach applications. We need to teach students how to figure out to learn on their own how to use these things. And guess what? They're already doing it. You know, I don't mean to be critical, but you saw how tough it was to pull a video up from a PowerPoint there. That's because, not because of a problem of the technology, not because of a problem of the user, but because of a problem of our expectations. We start integrating these into multimodal uh, documents, we're going to have a different kind of system, a different kind of flow, a different way of thinking about things. Think about your own syllabus, and if it wasn't just written where images fall into this, where video falls in, where audio falls in. And think about the stuff your students are making. Think about how tough it would be for us to eliminate that one paper assignment. I heard a talk, what was it, Tuesday? We heard a talk, somebody said, don't know why we call them papers anymore. <laughs> Nobody's writing on paper. But how tough is it to replace one of your assignments with something digital? to ask your students what does it mean to visualize the data that they're working with. STEM folks, we've heard it over and over again about how important the communication of data and scientific knowledge becomes now. It's not just about finding the data, it's communicating the data. All of this allows our students to do this. So my question to us as faculty, as teachers, is why have all these other universities are making this stuff available to their students we're not. How are we going to be vanguard? How are we going to tell our students, you need to be out there creating augmented reality, virtual reality, data visualization projects. Oh, but you're on your own for the tools to do that. Engineers, I'd like to do all your work without CAD. Remember what it took to get CAD initially? We're at a different shift now. Now we need a full suite of tools. The other thing that this does is it takes us out of the freaking classroom. It's all here, mobile. I want my students to realize that where they work, where they think, where they write, isn't driven by the place where they are. That they can get out into the spaces. So uh, one of the things I head up in the Department of English is the Trace Innovation Initiative. Um, we work in augmented reality and virtual reality. Oh, by the way, yes, I am in an English department. Um, one of the things we need to recognize nationally, and I will promo UF's English department because it's sort of my job as chair, right? <laughs> English departments traditionally study what people read and write and how they read and write, and those things have drastically changed. Uh, UF's English department is known as a, a very tech-savvy department. So we've created these things called augmented reality criticisms, and we provide the app so that you can go make these, and these are where you go to a place and you provide the information that they're not providing for you at the place. So for instance, you'll get a kick out of this. We just released to the world SeaWorld, S-E-E-W-O-R-L-D, downloadable free app. You can go take a counter tour of SeaWorld Orlando, and our app will gladly tell you what SeaWorld's not telling you about, oh, I don't know, the uh, nest robbing of eggs, 
the numbers of deaths of sea lions, uh, where, how many orcas have died. And guess what? You get that tour at their park. This. So we posted this, put out a national press release, newspapers start calling us, and UF takes it down. Interestingly, UF says, this is exactly the vanguard kind of move we need to be making. <laughs> but we get all of our money from the tourist industry, and you're pissing off the tourist industry. So now we're engaged in a battle about academic freedom, critique, copyright, and vanguard technology. So digital literacy, do we want our students making these cutting edge things? Then why aren't we giving them the tools? And why aren't we showing them how we're using these tools? I'm telling you, make your syllabus and spark. Show your students that you're engaged in the digital and that you want them to be engaged in the digital. So this is Spark. Um, all it asks you is, what do you want to make? A web page, a presentation, and all of these are professional caliber. They provide databases of images, video, or you can include your own, make your own. It's also, and I will, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to, to Jennifer, and I saw the woman here somewhere earlier, it's also a great starting po point for the e-portfolio. Think of the stuff your students are going to be able to show prospective uh, employers when it's not just a resume, but it's this dynamic retrospective of the work that they're producing. You know how neat it is to be able to travel around the country and show what students are making? This is free. And yet, most of us in this room are going to go, oh, I don't know, how would I put a picture in my syllabus? 80% of communication, visual. So how do we then bypass that instructor resistance? Because that's really the snack, right? You start doing this in your class, what are your students going to do? They're going to start doing this as well. Your students are already doing this, by the way. They're posting videos. They're making memes. They understand about the relationship between text and image. This is the new writing environment. It's not just about teaching grammar, and this is not to supplant writing. This is not to supplant your content. This is to extend, open, and emerge those possibilities of what comes next. That sort of drives me as a teacher, and always asking what comes next. So how do we bypass that instructor resistance to this level of engagement? Okay, I'm going to do another one of those hokey things that you see at leadership conferences. Everybody go like this. Everybody know this one? My grad students should know this one. What thumb's on top? Left or your right? Okay, why? Take your hands apart. Put it back the other way. How's that feel? Oh, that's weird. That's not natural, man. Make a bet with you. Do that four or five times a day for the next two weeks. And then take them apart and put it back together that way. What is that called? Habit. This is a habitual action. It's not inherent. It's not natural. So how do we overcome teacher resistance to the digital? We make ourselves uncomfortable. We do the very thing that we tell ourselves, oh, I don't know if I like that. We deliver part of our content in a digital way we haven't tried before. We make our syllabus interactive. We make our syllabus organic. We make our syllabus in spark. We make our syllabus driven by the image rather than the word. Wouldn't you like with your syllabus? How many of you have that? Have that we, we're all teachers. We know this. How many times do you have to tell your students it's in the syllabus? Right? <laughs> How many times would you like to be able to say that, though, and have your students come back to that syllabus, and there you are saying, this is the part I was telling you about. <laughs> to have that embedded voice, that embedded video, ingrain that right in it. This isn't about online education only. This is brick and mortar teaching. Think about how many times you give your students an assignment, and they sit there and they take a bunch of notes, and they get all gung-ho about the assignment, and then they leave your classroom, 
they cross university and they sit at the swamp and then they go to a game or something. And then the day before the assignments due, they look back at their notes and they say to themselves, what was it they meant by that? What am I supposed to do? Well, what if that capture of what you said about that assignment is right there built into the syllabus next to the assignment so that they can re-engage with you that same vibrance from that moment in class? And you can do all that sitting at your desk. You don't have to go to CCIT and take, you know, sit in front of their green screen. Spark, one click, record video. Hey, in this assignment, I really want you to do some research about this, this, and this, and then come up with a solution to this problem. Got any questions? Here's my email. Click by. Think about that engagement with your student who is more apt when they want to learn how to do something to go to lynda.com or to YouTube and Google, how do I do that? Learning how to learn. Teaching our students the methodologies of where they find the information that they're going to need to operate in this digital literate world. So one of the things I thought we would do today, but I'm not going to do it, because I have to say that um, listening to Andy really, really kind of got me, me jazzed a little bit there. Um, you know, it's great that our online programs are doing so well. But a lot of us don't teach online. And a lot of us want that student experience to involve that face-to-face. -face. And a lot of us want that student experience to be something more dynamic and more relevant to what one of the top institutions in the country can provide. But the truth of the matter is, I can't provide that just as a person sitting there talking to another person. Because my work, my research, my writing requires these things. And so I need my students to see that. I need my students to see, I'm not just showing you this stuff because it does you good. I need you to see that this is how work gets done. Collaboration. Dynamic delivery. You know, we keep, you know, we heard these words earlier today um, in the presentation of the awards, and I think this is really interesting that we've set up these dynamics where we need the content expert, then we need the design expert, and then we need the communicator. Yeah, that model's gone, people. Anybody a Dilbert fan? Yeah. You remember the tech writer? There was a character, she was a tech writer. You notice that she hasn't been in Dilbert in over 20 years? You know why? Because that position doesn't exist in the real world anymore. There isn't a tech writer. The person who is the content expert is expected to be the document designer, expected to be the writer. You're expected to do all of these things. And let me tell you, having a content expert, a design expert, and a communication expert, that's not collaboration, that's quilting. That's me still being an expert. Not in these other things, I can defer to the design person on this. That's patchwork. Collaboration is all of us doing all of those things. That's the world we live in now. That our students have to understand where does an image fall into this? Why is that image there? Is it purely aesthetic? Does it deliver content? And how have I placed it in that? How does my design element fall into this? You know, I, we've all seen the syllabus where somebody has put a picture of the molecular structure or the author or whomever. You know, I'm gonna make mine really dynamic. I'm gonna write a Word document and I'm gonna put a picture in it. <laughs> now I'm multimodal. That's not the point. The point is, what does that picture convey? Where is the information there? How is content being delivered by that image? That to me is why we as faculty have to take up a very different position about digital literacy on the campus of the University of Florida. So to poke the bear a little bit, Jennifer knows this, a couple of other people in the room know this, I've been trying to get UF to become creative campus, to make these tools available to our students for free. Now, granted, UNC has a faculty of, what did we say, 2,500, something like that? A student population of uh, just over 25,000. 
We're twice that size. We're also very siloed. Even in our academic collaborations, we are spread out. But the truth of the matter is, until faculty start demanding and showing the need and the use for these tools, we're still going to be quilting and piecemealing. We're still going to be looking for ways, how do I make these things available to my students? When in fact, they should already be an inherent part of the UF literacy of how we do things. So yeah, part of me today wants to say, why aren't we talking to our administrators about providing our students with the absolute best tools out there? without charging them for them, making them an available part of what we do at UF. But I also get that from an administrative standpoint. Believe me, my last three years as chair have taught me what it means to have to deal with budgets, lack of resources, and the walls you run into in a siloed community when you ask for resources. But we all know that. So going back to my initial question then, about overcoming instructor resistance. I've asked you to think about making your syllabus in Spark. I've asked you to think about including a digital project as one of your assignments. So now I'm going to ask you the big question. Can you get loud on this campus and let the administration know that we are doing a disservice to our students by not providing the best tools available? This is akin to us sending our students out into the world unable to read and write in a world that is literate. This is sending our students out into a digital world without the tools to be digital literate. And that to me is a, an instructor <coughs> pedagogical ethic that we all need to be attuned to. I'm gonna end on that and if you have questions and answers, you wanna throw stuff at me, that's fine too. But this is why digital literacy has to be a part of what all of us are doing at all times. I'm not asking you to change your research program. I'm not asking you to change curriculum. I'm just asking you to think about where does this fit in what I do and what my students are going to need to do. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, so you gave it from the, from the teacher perspective. How about from the student? How about the student that wants to set up PowerPoint and give it off to them? What do you tell them? So first of all, I tell them PowerPoint's an obsolete technology. But uh, <laughs> I completely get that. But we were talking in this workshop about getting your students to be empowered and invested in the learning. And sometimes a student needs to be shown this is more than just rote knowledge. This is about academic participation, civic participation, personal participation. And what this does is empower you to put yourself in this research. My, my, my real objective when I use this stuff is I want students to think about things beyond the road. Yes, sir, there's some disciplines where they need the road as well. I'm not also advocating that this be everything all the time. This is not an end-all, be-all panacea. This is an approach. And for some teachers, it will work. For some contents, it won't work. But generally speaking, this is the direction the world is moving in. You know, I can say from my own field, I'll make a prediction. For years and years and years, we all thought freshman English was the universal. Every student's going to take freshman English. We're going to get their writing. They're going to get their introduction to what does it mean to do research. I will, I will predict that in the next five years, most major universities across the country eliminate the composition requirement in favor of a digital literacy requirement because that's where this is happening. And that I take is indicative of where the employment world, the civic world, how we engage things. I mean, look at the idiocy of our elections over the last couple of years and how much of that was digital media driven rather than, than content. And knowing how to participate, to analyze, to be critical thinking problem solvers, solvers in that environment is crucial. So what I would say is, when it fits, it fits, but it's not always going to fit. So can you give any specific examples in the use of how this is being used, either project-wise or how students are actually implementing this in their courses? Sure, absolutely. So we're, we're at the beginning of this, too, and part of it is we're limited by licensing. 
Uh, so in fact, I have in front of the University Curriculum Committee right now a course called Digital Literacy and Digital Creativity with the intent of teaching multimodality, of teaching what does it mean to write audio? What does it mean to write video? What does it mean to write the multimodal text? So that the students are actually learning what does it mean to compose, to revise, to invent, to do all, to do research primarily before creating these documents. That these things don't happen out of the blue. That it still requires the academic rigor of all those things we do as researchers. And that's really where we're focusing on it. Is it's not so much learning how to, I don't know, uh, change uh, your, your color settings in Premiere. It's asking the question of, from a rhetorical standpoint, why would I change my color set settings here to start thinking through the problem solving and that, the rhetoric of it. That's why, that's why basically also, to be honest, this is why the humanities is crucial to a university like this. Because the moment we stop asking the question of poetics, the question of where does this fit culturally, the question of the politics of everything we do, then we've given up on education and we've made everything simply about the rote and about making sure that knowledge is static. It's always got to be guarded by that question of ethics, poetics, rhetoric, design, all of it. So you got me up on the stand now, people. Can you explain how, how you deal with any sort of plagiarism? Or copyright issues? Exact same way we do any other way. We teach copyright. We teach the difference also between copyright and trademark. We also teach the difference between critique and parody. We, we address all of that. The same. It doesn't usurp what we've always done. It doesn't supersede it. It expands it. I'm not saying, oh, suddenly everybody will, you know, we'll all have AI implants and we can, you know, we can Johnny Mnemonic download everything. That's going to be really cool. I can't wait. But, um, <laughs> what this does is gives us more tools to engage the stuff we're already engaging. Well, no other questions. Yep. This is maybe a little bit off topic, so I apologize. But just out of curiosity, have you? incidentally engage the graduate school regarding the nature of dissertations as they currently stand? Huge question for us. Yes, we have, we are. Um, so for instance, right now, of all of my PhD students who are writing dissertations, who would have traditionally Sarah, Ariel, some of the other of our grads who graduated uh, in here, they would have written about something, particularly about technology. Now we're requiring that if you're gonna write about it, you gotta make it also. So if you're going to write about virtual reality, you better have a virtual reality component. You're gonna write about video, you better be making video. Augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, 3D printing, uh, any of it that's tech driven, we want them making as well. And you know how amazing it is when our grad students go on the job market and every other person who's on the job market says, oh, I wrote, wrote this great paper about something and our grad students go, yeah, well, I made it. Um, there's no doubt it has affected our um, our job placement. So the but the grad school is something we're having to well we're having to talk about it because the big issue for the grad school is curation. Where do they put these things? How does it count it? But it is a huge part of the conversation we're going to continue to have with the grad school. And I think that's part of this larger conversation of faculty involvement. I want my students making VR projects rather than writing about freaking Moby Dick again. Sorry. <laughs> Yep. One, one side note to that, though, because I agree. The libraries have been great in providing stuff. A lot of our grad students do a lot of workshops in the libraries for stuff. Keep in mind, though, that primarily, particularly the Maker's Lab and such, there is an asterisk that says students only faculty because of copyright issues in developing apps and such. We can't go over there as faculty and build apps. Just so you know, that is really a student driven, but it is a great, there's some great space over. And in Infinity Hall and in some of the other places as well. So we are seeing pockets. See, that's the thing, there are pockets around. We've got, good night, people. I just want to jump in really quick because they couldn't hear up this, on this side of the room, 
but um, the, uh, the tools, the Adobe Suite, and equipment uh, computers that will run that, equip, uh, the, that software are available at Library West and at other locations? All over. All over. Okay. Is it available for online students? Like I have students in Fort Lauderdale, so how would they access? And I know that you can go to the library and we can go in off campus, but can they access any of those tools off campus? Those are available through apps.ufl.edu. Got it. Yep. There we go. Apps.ufl.edu. Adobe. Adobe. It's not. You don't have full access to the cloud because the cloud is something you know you work independently on your stuff wherever it is. If you're using the library license, it's it's in the library. Sparks everywhere. Say again. Sparks. Yeah. Everywhere. Spark is everywhere, and free. Yep. So just as an example of us like living in this siloed world, um, so I work for a, a center that's a grant of the CDC, and um, we provide we create training and education for healthcare workers. Um, and I hear like I know students are doing projects and stuff, and we get interns from like the public health department and stuff that come and do internships. But students that would be interested in creating things, um, like we would love to have some student interns, but like and any of y'all are welcome to come talk to me, but how, you know, how to get that word out and find, because I know there's students looking and, you know, it goes in both directions, but we all hang out, right? Right, here. so and, and as soon as you said that, my, we send a lot of our grads over to the library to do internships, uh, to do uh, workshops, all sorts of things like that. There's another opportunity for my grads to do these right. things. So yeah, that's the thing. We don't communicate at all of this well. And besides, you're the CDC. We do zombie stuff. So you know. <laughs> it sounds a lot more fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the relationship between the English department and AR and VR. And Absolutely, and love where, to. Where Sure. So for me, right, so I could, if I had it here, I could show you an, uh, an immense amount of data on the growth of VR technologies and the growth of AR technologies. And while most people are really excited about VR technologies, VR technologies are much more expensive than AR. AR is much more mobile. Anybody can make AR. You can pull this out right now. Um, Erasma just changed its name to something with HP. You could, you could augment this room in a minute and a half with anything you want. It's easy. It's, it's, it's great to do, and for me, so what it Pokemon teaches. That's Pokemon Go, for anyone who's not quite sure yeah. what augmented reality is. Just yeah. like Pokemon Go, that's. Augmented. It's overlaying data onto a view of what's in front of you in reality. VR is also trapped spatially. You have to be tied to a unit, whereas this lets you go. For me, AR is important because it promotes civic writing. My students can go to SeaWorld and write, you know, rewrite SeaWorld. So it's a new writing environment. It changes. So for me, the whole idea of critique, I should be able to walk into Publix and if there's a product I'm interested in, get an augmentation telling me about it in the same way I would get a review. By the way, uh, there are two companies that are trying right now to control all AR channels and they've already got all top 500 corporations and things. So AR is growing so rapidly. And part of what makes it grow is the release of Apple X, the lens, for those of you who are not tech people, Lenses are designed to have particular effects and work with particular, they're not all innocent. We actually have politics of glass grinding. Um, the new Apple lens is a, an AR designed lens. It's designed for AR overlay. So that when you're, you know, you pull up Google Maps or something, you get the real world vision of where things are. Oh, that's your building, that, all of that. So where I see it going is it's going to be one of the next primary public forms of writing. And it's so easy to do now that you literally do it from your phone wherever you are, uh, or you can do it at a desktop and have it, you know, have it sent out. Um, as, as a note to that, uh, in terms of crashing silos, I will say that the English Department of the Trace Innovation Initiative um, this past year won one of the university's tech fee grants, collaborating with Art and Art History, the libraries, um, Inno uh, Innovation Hall, uh, Infinity Labs, Communications and a couple others. Uh, there's a program that Ben Locke in uh, computer science uh, started called VR for Good, and we're pushing to make UF the applied VR hub of the country. And VR for Good puts teams of students together to build VR applications that have to have either social or ecological good as an outcome, rather than just using it as gaming. And so um, it's a huge program that's growing at UF to make us one of the biggest VR app developers in the country as well. And that's, again, English department was right in the middle of all of that. Because, like I said, we read and write very differently these days. 
or as I like to say a lot, we are not your grandfather's English department. <laughs> All right, I'm assuming that I would, I would sit up here and rattle all day. I appreciate you all taking the time to listen to me. Uh, Jennifer, thank you all, everybody, for the conference. It's been great, and I'm going to step down and let somebody else. Uh... <laughs>